Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, it's time for your toaster to get busy. Know what I'm saying? Do you? It's sex. We're talking about toaster sex. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Seth Nelson. I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Pete Wright. How has divorce impacted your sex life? Have you noticed a difference in intimacy as you move through your separation, dating, and even sex in your subsequent marriages? How has your experience communicating about your sexual interests and experiences changed through divorce? Dr. Joe Court is a psychotherapist and founder of the Center for Relationship and Sexual Health and a board-certified clinical sexologist. He's here today to help us navigate the uncertain waters of your post-divorce sex life. Joe Court, welcome to the toaster. Thank you for having me to the toaster. We forgot to put in that fancy intro that uh, you're also the host of the Amazing Smart Sex Smart Love podcast. I am. That is my podcast. Yes. Thank you. That is your podcast. And it's fantastic. And uh, I've been listening to you uh, uh, speaking to my soul all morning uh, as I've been binging on your show leading up to this conversation. So very excited to have you here and talk about just sort of the changing landscape of sex as you move through the stages of your relationship in and around divorce. Is this is this a question that comes up for you uh, often? It comes up if it starts bothering people, right? So if they are, um, they're a couple and they've had this huge power struggle and sex has been, you know, part of their arguing and um, part of their uh, issue. And then they decide, you know what, let's just separate or break up. I don't want to do this anymore. And then suddenly sex comes back and they want each other and it's hotter than it's been in years. And they're like, is something wrong with us? Like, you know, then, cause then they use that as, well, maybe we should stay together. So then they try to stay together and it goes back to how it was. And they say, no, I'm not, we're not going to do it. And then there you are all over again. What is that? What is that yo-yo about? So it's the power struggle. Here's what happens. We all have what now today people call the love bomb, romantic love, limerence. When we get together with somebody, we have matching sex drives, max, matching libidos. Uh, you know, we always are prepared and wanting sex with that person. That goes away, right? And then you, it goes away and then you hit the power. It's the romantic love part. Then you hit the power struggle with all the differences between you and your partner surface. And when you hit the power struggle, you start to have um, issues with each other and start to have negative feelings toward each other. And the desire for sex goes away or reduces because I don't feel so good about you. When you decide to break up a relationship, you break up the, the power struggle. You no longer have it because you're not committed anymore. It's only in the context of commitment that it's there. Okay. I have a lot of questions. And usually on this show, I like to be open, honest, and vulnerable. And I am 100% doctor okay talking about sex. But I do have a concern that I just want to get out there right okay. away. In talking about sex, and we all are going to be talking from our own experiences, if my girlfriend listens to the show, I'm very concerned that there's a high likelihood that I'm going to have less sex based upon what I say in this show. <laughs> Any help with that? And I will also share one other thing. I told her that was my concern about this show. And just telling her that got me in trouble. <laughs> well, the, the issue is hope, what I love about what you are doing with her is you're having a sexual health conversation. Most couples that are heterosexual or mixed sex, we call them now, male, female, um, are not uh, having those. Gay and lesbian couples talk about sex from the beginning. From their dating apps. So at least you're having that conversation. That's going to be the gateway to get to um, being able to talk this through. Look at that, Pete. I already got I'm doing something right. I know it kills you. I hate it. I hate it. I need a bell. <laughs> I, I feel like that is a that's a question that I, I want to talk more about, though, uh, in the spirit of, you know, people who are getting uh, who are getting a divorce, who are looking to separate, and they've been dealing with maybe those power struggles. What do we have to learn about having uh, better, more healthy conversations about sex uh, so that the sex isn't it doesn't necessarily have to be the thing that breaks up the marriage. I know. It's because of the ju- the fear of judgment, the fear of shame, the fear feeling the fear of being alienated. So if I'm getting a divorce, I can start to tell you anything because who cares, right? Where it doesn't matter yeah. my attachment to you. Um, but I'll tell you who talks about sex the best is after infidelity. Couples 
that experience infidelity, then after what in the recovery on the other side, they are more willing and uh, to do that because they should have been doing it all along. But the, it, but m- some of that led to the infidelity. So now they're willing to talk about it because everything was at risk before. And now they're more comfortable after infidelity. So I just got to chime in here. Sorry, Doc. On the advice of counsel, do not go have an affair just so you can talk better about sex afterwards. That is a great caveat. I tell that to my couples as well. Yes. <laughs> may, may it please okay, the court. Good. Just making sure. Yeah. Well, and set to that point, like how often do you end up with people who come to you and say, I'm divorcing and it's because we don't have a healthy sex life. Seth, sex has gotten in the way of what we're of our marriage to the point that we can't have a marriage anymore. I mean, you know, as a sex therapist, probably it's higher than most therapists, but it's predominantly what I see in here that they come in and this is a make it or break it because of sex. And it's because they're not talking about the reality and what they both really want. Is it fair to say that they come to you and they say that's the problem, but that's not really the problem. That's a symptom of their problem. Yes, yes, it can be both. Uh, but yes, it's that that the sexual problems are symptomatic of other things that are going on. But sometimes the sexual problems are the are the problems. Pete, to answer your question directly, though, rarely do I ever hear that. I also rarely ask, why are you getting a divorce? I'll ask, are you sure you want to go through with this? Are you ready for this? Here's what the process looks like. Here's what it looks like on the other side. It's hard to see it when you're going through it. So it really depends. Now, if they want to tell me, of course, I'm going to listen. But I just make sure that they are going down this path when, and sometimes they're not ready. They don't want it. The other side is initiating it. But I'll have those conversations more to, oh, so why are you getting a divorce? That's not usually something that I'll Sure, ask. sure. By the time they get to you, they're already dealing with different yep. issues. And we've talked about yeah. that in other shows, right? Okay. So, All right. Well, on our, on our point today, so lesson number one, everybody, let's learn to have better sex conversations. All right. Uh, number two, how does the, the sexual experience tend to change coming out of a marriage where sex was the challenge? And so now we're talking about like dating sex uh, and and moving into subsequent relationship sex. What do you find people have are learning about themselves and what do they need to learn to make sure that their sexual relationships are healthy ones and good ones? Well, sometimes, especially in the second marriage or the, the rela- second relationship, whatever, they'll, they'll say to themselves, I'm going to do sex differently. I'm going to, uh, you know, talk about it differently. And they don't. They get back in and they're love bombed. And when you're love bombed and that romantic love, I'm telling you, we don't have to say anything. You know what I want already. You're willing to do things you wouldn't normally be willing to do. So you just think, oh, I don't have to do that with this person. And then that goes away and they're back to where they were. Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing, uh, people don't understand this. There's always a sexual desire discrepancy between couples. One wants it more, one wants it less. If you break up with that person, and you might be the one who wants it more, and you're with somebody that wants it less, you break up, you go to the next person, and you're like, I'm going to get somebody with a higher sex drive. And you do, but now it's higher than yours. So now you're the lower <laughs> desire, and they're the higher <laughs> desire. So you're always in the situation. It's very rare to be a matching desire unless you're in the love bomb stage. Okay, we've had somebody said we've we've talked to somebody on the show who dropped a love bomb, and I I had to have it explained to me uh, as a layperson, and I feel like you've you've brought it up several times here, and I think we need to teach about it just for a, just for a second. Can you tell us what is the love bomb, and why are we why do we have to be uh, worried about it? It can be so problematic that some cultures don't even aspire to the love bomb uh, because uh, it can attach you to the wrong person. What happens is you you're going to and you find this person who you're romantically interested in, but you're also sexually attracted to. So it's familiar love. There's somebody there that that um, is you're drawn to that that you're you, you you fall in love. So if you're depressed, you're no longer depressed. If you have a low sex drive, you have a high sex drive. You have internal pharmacy chemicals being released: dopamine, oxytocin phenylethylamine, which is also known as PEA, everything increases. If you are um, somebody that experiences uh, an addiction, sometimes addictions subside during this time because you're in an altered state. And the, the purpose of this altered state in the love bomb is to bond you with an incompatible person. So, you know, people think, well, I'm divorcing because of incompatibility. In the work I do, I say, we want to keep you together because of the the incompatibility is grounds for a relationship, not a divorce. So, but you don't see the incompatibility. The love bomb is like, oh my God, I always say this, look at my, my partner's fingers. They're beautiful. I want to kiss them. I want to have sex with them. And then when the love bomb fades and romantic love fades, 
all you see is this, right? <laughs> well, it was always there, but you uh-huh. think, oh, I see it. Yeah, but I thought, oh, well, I'll just focus on the other eight or I'll amputate the one, you know, whatever. No, 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 no. Yeah. It comes right along with you. That middle one is right there all the time. And, yep. And it does not go away. It's been there all the long. The call was coming from inside the house. That's my favorite line. <laughs> 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 I, I think there is a lot to to learn about this, particularly if your relationship is trouble. And you just said something else that really hit home for me, which is, you know, I'm I'm divorcing because uh, of an incompatibility in the marriage. And th- your job is, uh, I want you to keep you together. Incompatibility is the basis of a relationship. That should be on a T-shirt, man. Yes, it's a great line. It's a great line because people think, well, all these differences mean that we're, you're wrong, I'm good, you're bad, I'm wrong, you're right, whatever. And then that in uh, and to, it gets embedded in the bedroom. And instead of being people being able to negotiate all that and negotiating sexual differences, we could talk about that later. That's very, very hard. Well, let's talk about all that right. now. <laughs> so when you talk to people and you're saying to us, hey, you have to have better sexual conversations. What does that sound like? What should people be talking about? And when I talk about this, I want people to hear that it's not so easy. I don't mean to make it sound easy. I, I, you know, I've had my own journey around sexuality. I'm a gay guy um, and I have my own kinks and fetishes. And uh, I met my husband and didn't really share a lot of that with him. So it took over time for me to talk to him about those things was super hard. But that's what it entails is being able to show up and say, this is who I am. This is what I like. And we're with the worry and anxiety that your partner is going to be disgusted. And when your partner's disgusted, they find you disgusting. That's what happens. You know, people use the disgust response to help people with politics, right? And how to vote. It's also used, um, and not used, but people experience it during sex. And you have to almost put armor on and say, yeah, my partner might find me disgusting. Well, we have another saying in sex therapy. I love this. Don't yuck somebody's yum. You ever heard that? Yeah. I love that. That's a good one. And so, but your partner might yuck your yum. When you're having these conversations, you might say, this is what I enjoy. This is what I'd like to do. Or I'd like to try this. And you just have to be open, honest, and vulnerable about that. But you are really looking for a response from your partner that doesn't make that like disgusting or what are you talking about? Or I don't want to be with you anymore. But being vulnerable, that's a potential outcome, right? Right. And then hearing no, right? So a partner might say, no, I'm not going to do that. And then in therapy, this is a problem. I have to train therapists out of this. Just because there's a no doesn't mean the yes has to go away, right? It might mean that the you're not going to tell the no, you have to do this. I'm not talking non-consent, but the yes still it wants to do this. So the conversation needs to be persisted. It needs to go on. But I'm still a yes. So maybe I want to look at erotica online. Maybe I want to, you know, have an open marriage. Maybe I want to do webcam sex, but it won't involve you. That kind of thing. Wow. And that's that's uh, that's where I I can resonate with the experience of when you get a no, it shuts it down with like the gate of shame. Yes. Like, I don't even want to persist to the conversation because I already know that. I mean, I've, I've never heard it put quite that way that I've, I've never heard that just because the the yum has been yucked doesn't necessarily have to equate to internalizing the disgust factor. That's well said. I really like the way you said that. Absolutely. Wow. Seth, how you how you feeling? I, look, man, I'm all in yum right now. Yeah, I'm right. Good. <laughs> so I like, you know, I got a bag full of candy over here. Brother. I'm good. So does this change from relationship to relationship is Marry, like I get the love bomb sex. We talked about that. And then you're married. Let's just take that as the hypothetical. And then you get divorced. And now you're out there dating. And then you get married again. Is it the same pattern? Does it change? Do people think it's going to change, but it doesn't? Is there a real difference either psychologically or physically on post-divorce dating? Because I've heard this from my client, like, oh my God. 
the sex that I'm having out here is amazing. I should have gotten divorced years ago. It sounds to me like they might be in the love bomb section. Well, no, they could be also somebody that was conscious enough to know what they were looking for and having the conversations in the next marriage, being very intentional. Because most people, they're like, I'm just going to hope for the best. Or I could tell that this person was um, going to be okay with it. So I, I went with it when they never had the conversation. And then they find out, no, 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 they're with exactly the same kind of partner. So the people, it's beyond love bombing. If somebody finds found the right partner and really worked at, hey, these are my fetishes, my kinks, my interests, my the things I love, then you can find a better partner for yourself. How does this relate like to finding yourself? Because it seems like you're really talking about internal yeah. stuff that you then have to express to someone outwardly to have the conversations. So do people come to you that they don't know what they like? Yes. In fact, they're starting to think about redoing all the research um, with because most research is done on college age kid, um, young people uh, and college. They don't know shit. <laughs> they don't know anything. They don't, and they don't know shit about For sex. Sure. They're not evolved enough. You know, I mean, at my age of 58 years old, I'm evolved. I mean, I always knew what I liked, but I've really refined it over the years and they have not. So um, wait, I got to wait from what you asked me. Though. What was your question? Oh, do people know? I don't know. Let's just bash 20 year olds now. <laughs> I'm good about that. <laughs> well, by the, but you know, a lot of 20 year olds do kind of know a little bit more than we knew at, at, when we were 20 of what they want. They're too afraid to talk about it. They're too ashamed. And then they don't know what it means. And then they feel like there's something wrong with them. Like I, I must be damaged because I get into this. What you get into is often not politically correct. It's not aligned with your values during the day. Um, it's what you uh, Esther Perel is a great uh, sex and relationship therapist. We love her. Sure. And she says, what you protest in the streets is what you get into in the, between the sheets. And it's true. How did- I'm going to start protesting a whole <laughs> lot of different stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, I, got, I need t-shirts made. I need signs and hats and colors. <laughs> and, and I need longer nights now. Man, I've got so much stuff to work through. I, how does that apply to people who, are, who come to you and realize uh, that they've been in a marriage and that their sexual identity is, is changing? That now they, they were in, a, say, a heterosexual marriage and now they're, they're finding that their sexual tastes tend to be more fluid and they're, they're learning to embrace that. How does that uh, change the sexual relationship? I'm, I'm thinking specifically about that yo-yo pattern you were just talking about, like power dynamics are power dynamics, but is it different when you're looking at I, questions of identity and fluidity? Well, it's a little bit more threatening to the relationship, I notice. Like, um, because, you know, now if you're not 100% straight, then you're not going to want to be with me or you're going to want to open the marriage, or you're going to want to be with others. And it's, a, it's a, a higher code red threat. It's still threatening for a partner to hear, hey, um, I'm into this fantasy and I really want to engage in you with this because you're afraid. Well, what if I don't want to? Are you going to leave me? Are you going to find someone else? It's the same thing. Let me get that straight. Because I've, I've been thinking of this conversation of, I ask for something, my partner says, no, I'm the yuck, I'm the disgusting. But it's also the other way is, if I don't say yes, what happens to me if I'm the one getting the request? And that can be a problem right. too, right? Maybe people just say yes because they're afraid of losing someone, though they don't really want to be doing X, Y, or right. Z. Instead of saying, hey, I'm not really into this. Can we keep talking about it until we find a win-win? And it's going to be a lose-lose too. We're both not going to get what we want, but it's important to you. We do this on other things, how we're going to raise kids, how we're going to manage money, where we're going to live. We should be doing it about sex too. And people don't. Hmm. This is going to seem like a really simple question. That's not. Why not? Why are, why are people not having these conversations? When it comes to sex, the most uncomfortable person controls the room. And that's what happens. The most uncomfortable person controls the relationship, controls a lot of things. And so their discomfort and their what we call erotophobia, the fear of sex, the threat of sex, the disgust of sex, or something sexual, um, I think the shame is just super high. And it's because people aren't talking about it above board. They're doing it online or in private in locker rooms, you know, as jokes. They're not talking about it seriously. And, you know, I just want to say this a lot of when I teach, tell parents to talk to their children about sex, they can't do it. And then they don't do it. And it's not because they don't want to, because nobody talked to them about sex. They don't have the language. They don't know how to do it. They don't have the 
rehearsal. We had a rule with my kids and my kids are now, you know, my son is a sophomore in high school, my daughter's in college, but we always had a rule growing up that whatever question they had, we would we would answer and talk honestly and we we aren't afraid of words. That was our mantra. We aren't afraid of words. And uh as a result, I I think I uh, embarrass the hell out of my kids way more often than, uh, m- you know, their peers in school. Like, they walked out knowing stuff that they didn't want to know. They just didn't know at the time they asked the question what regret they would have once they know. And uh, a- and that has been a real delight for me as a dad uh, and a parent <laughs> <laughs> that I was able to give my kids that... <laughs> bit of awareness. But I think that that's so important because when I ask those questions like, oh, you don't know what X, Y, Z is, you know, what we, we'll talk about whatever you want. And they tell me, no, they're not getting it from anywhere. Yeah. They're not getting information from anywhere in right. spite of taking sexual health and awareness and knowing, you know, taking all sorts of classes, you'd, you'd think these things would be covered. It's just, you know, there's so much that's just not. I would have a similar conversation with my son and mainly when he was in middle school, I would take him to shows that some people thought were inappropriate for that age. I purposely would take him because I knew there would be things that would come up in the show that he might not know about. So I took him to go see Book of Mormon. Oh, yeah. oh sure. That's going to lead to a lot yeah. of conversation. That'll do it. Right. And they have. And so I would ask him very directly, like, do you know the word clitoris? Yeah, I've heard of it. Do you know where it is? Mm, somewhere down there. And I said, we're going to have an uncomfortable conversation for 90 seconds because you need to know this. <laughs> and that's how I would start it. I said, you with me for 90 seconds? He's like, yeah. Because I was thinking, and doctor, I want to know what you think about this. My thought process was either he doesn't know it at all or he's going to learn it from somebody else that doesn't right. know it. So at least, you right, know. Give him bad information. Exactly. And then I can explain where it is, what it does, and then I can tell them you're ahead of the curve on 90% of the men out there yes. in the world, buddy. I just really helped you out. Yeah. <laughs> okay? That's awesome. Now, one thing you have to make sure you also tell them, not just where it is. I can't remember the sex educator that t- says this, but the clitoris is not a doorbell. You don't push on it like this. It's not a doorbell, right? You have to know how to work it, right? I wish I could remember her name. I want her to get credit. I can't remember. (laughs) The the only thing that would have been better if you would have said, it's not. (laughs) I know. I couldn't couldn't come up with it. I was too busy sort of hyperventilating. Uh, I I think that's such a great question. Now, I want to get back to the, to the, to the, uh, the question of rebalancing power in a sexual relationship relationship and a sexual dynamic, right? Because that seems to be, if you want to save your relationships, and we're all about saving relationships, rebalancing that power dynamic in a conversation and doing it in a healthy and productive way that doesn't spark that sort of alienation in one partner and the repression in another seems to be really important. How do you how do you counsel somebody, hey, here's how you start, you know, eight o'clock day one, here's how you start having those conversations. You don't do it before you're going to have sex or during sex. Those are the worst times to do it. I always tell people, you would, you would think people would know that they don't. You want to do it when you're no, going for a walk, <laughs> right? They don't. They think that it's going to work yeah. there and it doesn't. It actually becomes a problem and then will kill the sexual experience you're about to have. You want to do it when you're going for a walk. What is that? Is that because, it, is that like a hormonal thing? Is it because you're in the throes of whatever it is or is it, what's, what's going on there? Well, because now if you say something that your partner doesn't like and they go tilt, I'm not into you now. Disgust, I'm, I find you gross now. You know, now, so now you've, you've entered too many details where you, if you're taking a walk or you wake up on a Sunday morning and you want to, you're having your coffee, can we talk about better sex between us or, or, or having the kind of, you know, different kinds of positions or fantasies? Um, then at least if they go south or, or it gets negative, you haven't ruined an, a good experience you're about to have. Yeah, but. You just ruined a good cup of coffee. So <laughs> I mean, then <laughs> there you are watching your Jane Pauly on CBS Sunday morning. Now let me tell you what I see of that that, that contributes to a lot of divorce, and this really is upsetting. I do a lot of trainings on this because it's so freaking upsetting to me. So the whole term of sex addiction, right, is not real. Sex addiction is not 
real. We have no science behind it. If we did, it would be in the DSM. It would be in the ICD-11. It's not. So I don't want to get into all that. But what happens is it's the low-hanging fruit. Everybody thinks it's real. It's a cultural creation. So now the I see women in my office, and this is I usually see mixed-sex couples, men and women together, and they're heterosexual. And she says to him, you're either what you just told me, what you're doing, watching porn, you know, thinking about whatever you're thinking, you're either a sex addict or you're a pervert. And I'm not staying married to a pervert. So you better be a sex addict. So then he comes to my office like a kindergarten student with a note pinned to his shirt by his mommy that says, here's what my wife wants you to know. I'm a sex addict and and fix me. It's it's terrible. And the people divorce over this. It's so upsetting. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I guess I can see it. But also, I'm not sure I would want to stay married to somebody who uh, who lives with that kind of shame. Right. That is going to shame you for and then pathologize you rather than what it's not sex addiction. I mean, it, it, it could be compulsivity, but we have a sexual problem. So let's just hold yeah. on, doctor. Let me let me you just said something that is so important because I think it transcends the conversation we're having when you said don't pathologize somebody. You should be dealing with the behaviors and not playing psychotherapist and saying he must be this or she must be that, right? I cannot tell you how many people fell in love, got married, and get divorced five years later and their spouse is a narcissist. Like Statistically, that doesn't really happen. I'm not saying it never happens, but everyone wants to put a label on someone. And I say, look, I'm not going to fix that. This is how I deal with difficult people. I don't care what you call them. This is how I deal with it. And this is how I can help you through the divorce process. But is that something that you see a lot where people come in and do their self-diagnosis on what the other person yeah. is? I call it profiling your partner and I don't allow it in my room. I've done it myself. Stop profiling your partner. You're not their therapist. You can talk about, hey, when you said this and did this, this is my experience. This is what I feel. This is what I hear. This is how I respond. But I love what you just said. Pathologizing them makes them bad and you good, them wrong, you right. There's no good in that. Well, there's no good in that in rehabilitating a a damaged sexual relationship and certainly not in saving a partnership from divorce. No, you're going to add to it. That's going to make you go toward divorce. I, I want to shift over here for a second because I was thinking of different backgrounds. What does, if at all, does your different religious backgrounds or cultural backgrounds, if you are doing, like, I'm just making this up, if you're marrying someone from India who was raised in that culture um, versus someone that was raised in Birmingham, Alabama, or New York Jewish lifestyle versus someone that grew up on the West Coast in California with no religious orientation. What what kind of your background does that bring to this whole conversation? Ideally, people would talk openly about it from the beginning, but they don't. I'll tell you how many what we see a lot in therapy. Yeah, we 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 tried to talk about these things. It never goes well. In fact, it's getting worse, worse. And by the way, we're getting married in a month and we're so excited. And I'm like, <laughs> But if you're not getting any resolution and you're telling me it's worse, yeah, 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 it'll fix itself. Marriage will fix itself. People think this even in 2020 and you cannot talk these clients out of it. So they, I feel like they hire us to watch them fail and I have no choice other than to say, my prediction is marriage isn't going to fix this. It's gotten worse. I mean, let's fix this before you have this wedding, but people don't listen. Okay. That's like saying having a kid's going to fix the problem. Yeah, it fixes the problem. It doesn't fix the problem. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay. Uh, To to that point, I don't know. Okay. Well, yeah. Why do I need to worry about being indelicate with you guys? Uh, What? How important is it to uh, uh, to to practice? Do you know what I mean? Like there is a, a sense of parochial protection of sexual activity in some cultures that I'm going to save myself for marriage or I'm going to somehow be, you know, what, what is your, what's your stance on getting out there and finding good, healthy people to, to practice having strong sexual relationships with? Oh, I'm all for it. I, I mean, safely, consensually, of course. Um, but 
I'm all for people getting out there and uh, and and um, exploring their sexuality and their erotic interests, right? So it's not just sexual, it's erotic and pleasure. We don't talk enough about pleasure. You should enjoy, you should really find out what brings you the most pleasure sexually. And that's what you should be talking about with potential partners. Okay, but on the advice of counsel, if your spouse <laughs> or someone you're with says, you're really good at this, you're great at sex, I love having sex with you. Do not say practice makes oh, perfect. I'm just advising you. You're right okay? about that. <laughs> okay, good. I'm right twice tonight. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm telling a story for a friend. You know, I'm going um, to give that one so, to you, Seth. You deserve that. That was good. <laughs> that was good. Okay, but this does raise a point. What, if at all, is the role of discussing previous sexual relationships? Are they just taboo? You don't talk about them. You just talk about what you enjoy now or what you would like to try in the future. And you don't kind of talk about where that thought or originated or what happened in the past. How does that all play out? Well, I think out? people take it personally, like they take porn personally. Well, women take porn personally. Men take vibrators personally. You know, the women feel the porn has replaced her. The men feel the vibrators replaced him. And they feel that talking about past um, relationships, then you must have liked that better. There's no room in our culture to say, no, I like that. And I liked you. I got into that, but I'm also getting into stuff with you. People feel threatened and then they, they feel diminished when it's not about that at all. Hmm. Uh, th- I often get that same sort of um, that same sort of vibe around you talk about porn, you know, the, porn is a complicated issue, right? Because there is not just the, the sexual part, right? The the uh, arousal part of pornography and fetish and kink, but also the, the um, I, I guess there's a social stigma, there is a, you know, the issue of, you know, non-consensual and, and ethical, the ethical criminality, those kinds of things that are involved in porn. How do you approach that with people who are exploring other avenues? All porn is not alike. Some porn is unethical. Some porn is human trafficking. Some porn is child porn. Most porn is ethical. And so we talk about, and if, if you start making it about the conversation about the porn, you have lost the argument. And I tell therapists, you've lost your couple. The argument is, what does this bring up for me that you're watching it? Yeah. You know, what does it bring up for me that I like to watch it? And, you know, people always say, well, what's your porn use? You're not using porn. It's not a chemical. It can't be addictive. You can't be addicted to porn. There's nothing about it, it because people will say, well, you could be addicted to your own chemistry. No, you cannot. There is no science that you can be addicted to dopamine. You could be habituated to it. You'd like to jump out of planes and climb mountains. We all say, oh, that's cool. Well, how'd, they, how'd, you, how'd you do that? What do you feel up there? But if the person's naked and masturbating, we're like, whoa, dude, whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on? So it's, a, it's a, sort of like a sexual judgment that people have around stuff like that. Well, and I love the way you put that because once you once you get out of the the uh, judgment of the nature of what porn is, as you say, you can actually get to the root of what it brings up that there is an existence of it in your life, right? Not just an existence of it in the world, right? Because the truth is, some porn is so good that you people say, "Well, you don't base your sex life on porn." Well, some porn you absolutely want to base your sex life on. Some <laughs> porn is very instructional, and you're like, "Wow, I never thought I'd do," especially gay men. For gay guys, we don't know where, we don't, you know, finding gay porn is easy today, but um, it wasn't at one time. And so you, no one teaches you about gay sex. You know, how do you have anal sex? How do you have oral sex or whatever? So you learn it in gay porn. There's nothing wrong with that. Gay porn is pretty ethical. Ethical porn, Seth, right here. Show title. I know. And I'm thinking like t-shirts. We got like <laughs> two or three merch, more The merch t-shirts. out of this one episode. Huge. Is, is. Unbelievable. Wait, I'll give you one more t-shirt if you want. I'm actually okay. going to make yeah. t-shirts of this because it's my line. You can use it though if you want. Um, so a lot of straight men come in my office who like to uh, receive anal sex and um, they want to be pegged. It's called pegging where the woman puts a strap on on and, and a lot of, and, but a lot of women think he's gay. Uh, um, he's, well, uh, you know, he thinks he might be gay because he wants this. And I have to tell these couples, your anus doesn't have a sexual orientation. It doesn't know whether it's gay, straight, or bi. It's an anus. And just because you enjoy <laughs> receiving anal sex doesn't mean you're gay. There are gay men, and I'm one of them. I don't want anal sex. I've never had anal sex. I've never gotten it. I've never given it. And I'm gay as fuck, okay? But just because <laughs> I don't like to have penetrative sex doesn't mean that my butt is going to tell me that I'm straight someday, because I'm not. <laughs> Doctor, 
I would really appreciate if you just tell us how you feel. <laughs> you know, let's not let's not talk around the issues. You got to be able to talk openly and honest about. I try. This, you know, <laughs> there's no way we're ever so, going to understand what's really going on until we can speak the truth. So, what about like your first? sexual experience does that really play a role and i'm just going to share with you the first time i ever had sex and pete don't get uncomfortable I'm just so now. glad we're recording it. i'm so glad we're recording this <laughs> well it was it was late it, at night it was very dark i was very scared i was all by myself you know, see there it was pete <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> so but do those kind of first sexual experiences kind of pave the way or is it stuff that you see in the movies or because like you're saying like hey maybe there's something out there that i didn't even know i liked because i didn't even know it existed right uh when you say pave the way i think that it's like an imprint your first time is always remembered most uh your chemistry that gets uh, you into that altered state to have sex with that person is elevated everything's elevated so it's it becomes people always say it, it happens when you first fall in love as, as well people always say i never got over my first love you didn't but it may not be the person it may just be the chemistry and the experience that you had Got a lot of information here, Pete. You got a lot to digest, my friend. Yeah, I know. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this has been uh, a super <laughs> illustrative, Joe. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us. I just want to say one more thing because I think this is important. Yeah. And I tell clients this. People say, well, I shouldn't leave my wife. Everything's great. Or my husband. I shouldn't leave every, because everything's great except for sex. You shouldn't leave for sex. Sex shouldn't be that much of a, of a priority. Bullshit. It's complete bullshit. If sex is a priority to you, sex is a priority to you. But then you go to get feedback from your friends and family. They're like, well, sex fades over time. And then eventually you're going to be in a sexless relationship. Some people do. But if you don't want to be, you don't have to be. So sex is a very is a, is a fine reason to leave a relationship if you can't make it work. That's all I'm saying. It's almost like voting, right? You get to pick why you're voting for someone. The candidate doesn't get to tell you why. They can say, you should vote for me because, and they can list 10 things, and you're like, none of those are on my list. You get to decide what's important in your relationship, whether it's sex, whether it's having coffee in the morning or how you connect with your spouse, whether it's how you manage money with your, with your partner, all of those different, we could list off a 100 different things, how you raise children together, how you deal with adversity, how you deal with stressful situations, how you deal with happy situations. Hey, everything's great. Well, maybe dr everything's great. We're drinking too much because we're celebrating. Like You get to pick what's important to you in a relationship, and then you need to work with your partner to come together on the other stuff that's important to them. And it's not always going to match up, but as doctor says, those differences can be celebrated as well. But I, I think that goes for sex or anything else. Would you agree with that, doctor? I'm going for the trifecta, Pete. I'm trying to get a third yes here. I'm telling you now. I would tell you yes. The word is called differentiation, that that two realities or more can re exist between you, the, the two of you in relationship. That sounds, that sounds just like you and me, Seth. I mean, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. Different realities. Am I right? Totally. Hey, this has been fantastic. I already, I already uh, teased the podcast, but Joe. But please uh, give yourself a plug. We got to send people because if there is ever a podcast that deserves the the term unvarnished, this is the one. Well, thank you. So it's Smart Sex, Smart Love, and you can find it at smartsexsmartlove.com or my website joecourt.com. But my bigger presence that I just hit five hundred thousand followers is on TikTok. So on TikTok, I have made a huge hit on these issues. So if they went to at Dr. Joe Court, D-R-J-O-E-K-O-R-T, they'd find me there. So my podcast and TikTok are my biggest things. I can't. I, I'm not on TikTok. You've got to get on TikTok. I'm all of a sudden right now. I'm feeling that pressure. <laughs> Let me tell it you. It was Joe Court that made me join TikTok. Is that what's <laughs> going to be on my next T-shirt? Well, what you don't know is her, his 500,000 listener is your wife. So you better get on TikTok. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, God, okay. My wife, she my put him over the top. Over the top. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Noted. Joe Court, thank you so much. You are uh, such an asset to the field, and we really appreciate you coming and hanging out with us. Uh, I hope you come back one day. I'm sure we're going to have more topics to talk to you about. Thanks. You guys are fun to talk to. And thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. On behalf of Dr. Joe Court and America's favorite family law attorney, that's Seth Nelson. I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next week right here on How to Split a Toaster. 
a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, how to split a toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.